All right. Last week we did part one. First three verses of Revelation. Uh, pardon me, of Romans six. First three verses of Romans six. We entitled the lesson "Baptized into Jesus." Though we still have that up there, if you have an ink pen, this week's lesson is part two. So just put a part two after that, and you'll be up to date. I uh, didn't get that done. I hit the print button and didn't think about it. So um, this is Baptized into Jesus, part two. And what the first several verses in Romans 6 are about, the three we covered last week and the eight we're going to cover this week, they're about this concept of being baptized into Jesus. So last week, we identified, as you'll see in our review here in a few moments, different kinds of baptism the Scripture talks about. Now, in verses 1, 2, and 3, let's read them first. What shall we say then? This is in the review section. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Now, you that get up every morning, go about your busy day, You must scratch your head when Paul writes, We died to sin. That's a head scratcher, right? What do you mean I died to sin? We're going to get into some of that this morning. So since I died to sin, how can we live in it any longer? It doesn't make sense. It's not the air I breathe anymore. That beautiful course the worship team does from time to time this is the air I breathe sin is no longer the air we breathe we breathe the air of freedom through the word of God so how can we live in that atmosphere of spiritual smog that chokes us every day so how can we of course uh, Paul is not Paul had said in the previous chapter that uh, where sin increased, grace did much more increase. And so he starts this chapter off, if that's the truth, if grace increases when sin increases, shouldn't we go on sinning so that grace can go on increasing? And Paul said, absolutely not. We died to sin. That's not the sphere in which we live anymore. Verse 3. Don't you know, here's uh, where he uses the word baptized. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Now, I have, uh, there are some other baptisms spoken about in Matthew 3, 11, Acts 19, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. We'll get to that in a moment. But you know, in the Christian church in America, there are different doctrines about water baptism. There are churches that when you're a baby, they sprinkle you. Most churches, all the evangelical churches, immerse you in water. So, the two ways of how water baptism takes place is in some churches by sprinkling and other churches by immersion. But then when you get into the immersion in water baptism, there's still a couple different thoughts. This church, and in, in most evangelical churches, and again, when you hear me say evangelical, what does that mean? It just means that we believe this is the Word of God. It doesn't just contain the Word of God. It is the Word of God. More than that, we believe it is the infallible Word of God. God is not a man that he should lie. Everything he says here is true. So, the what I call the uptown churches, they believe it contains the Word of God, but it has error in it. And get, guess who gets to tell us what the errors are? They do. So they can throw this out, and they can throw that out. We evangelicals believe that's the infallible Word of God. That's what I mean by evangelical. We are an evangelical church here. We believe that God knew what He said when He said it and didn't stutter men every word of it and uh, so that's what we are as an evangelical now in the evangelical every evangelical almost 
every evangelical church immerses in water baptism. Uh, but some, Christ, the Christian church, the Church of Christ, some of these believe that water baptism is part of salvation. You're not truly saved till you're baptized in water. Uh, the rest of us believe that water baptism is an outward show of an inward act. It demonstrates in picture form what happened in spirit form when you gave your life to Christ. So, which baptism is he talking about in verse 3 up here in the review? Sprinkling or immersion? Neither one. He's not talking about water baptism. So, I, um, from those verses down there, I mention there are four types of baptism mentioned in the New Testament. Only one of them involves water. Now, in America today, usually when we think of baptism, we think of water. But that's only one of four New Testament baptism. The word <coughs> baptism in the Greek, remember the New Testament is written in Greek, means to dip. That's what it means. It is used in the dyeing of clothes. So if you got a white shirt and you want it to be red, you don't sprinkle stuff on it you dip it and when you dip it what's that mean if you're going to dye that shirt it's all going under every part of that shirt's going under well that's the word rendered baptism when referring to water so I'm a firm believer that when you get baptized every part of your body ought to be underwater at some point point. and if I don't like you you might stay under a long time <laughs> Not really. But anyway, there was one church that had to baptize, put you under three times, you know. Baptize you in the name of the Father. Bring you up. Do you believe? Yes, I believe. Baptize you in the name of the Son. Bring you up. Do you believe? Yes, I believe. Put them under the third time. I baptize you in the name of the Holy Spirit. Bring them up. Do you believe? Yeah, I believe you're trying to drown me. Uh <laughs> But at any rate, that's not quite the belief we're, we're looking for. We just put you under once in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And then when I dip you, I, I say in Jesus' name. Because everything we're taught, everything we do, we to do, do it in Jesus' name. So I use the formula that's given to us in Matthew 28. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But then I do the teaching of the New Testament that tells me when, when I'm putting you under, everything I do, I ought to be doing in Jesus' name. Plus, I'm trying to protect you from those who say you weren't baptized right because the right words. I've been baptized three times. Not in the name of the Father and the Son the Holy Ghost. Three distinct times. And uh, because uh, the first time I purposely got baptized the second time because I come to realize I didn't really get saved when I went up front the first time. I just continued to live the way I was. So when I really felt I was born again saved, then I wanted to be baptized. And then uh, the third time, I had a preacher friend who was allowing uh, me to stay at his house in my, when I was 18 or 19 trying to get into ministry. And he got into a doctrine where you had to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But they said the Father was called Lord in the Old Testament. The Son is Jesus. And Christ means anointed one. The Holy Spirit is the anointer. So they said... The name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost means in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it doesn't because Christ is the anointed one. The Holy Spirit is the anointer. They're two different things. But I needed a place to stay, so I let him baptize me too. <laughs> so what, the reason I brought up immersion, when he, dipped my, he baptized me in his bathtub, so when he dipped my head under, my knees came out. So I was never totally immersed. Now, that wouldn't mean much to some people. It means a lot to me because I believe if you're going to die closed, you get the entire thing underwater. But anyway, uh, look at the, the uh, things down here. Uh, baptism of water is one baptism. I took off baptism just to make room. I talked last week at the bottom of those three, baptism of fire. That's only mentioned in when John said, One comes after me, he'll baptize you with fire and with water, or water and fire, rather. And uh, uh, there's not any real clear teaching on it. So for, the most, uh, for, for this uh, review, I just put the main three. 
baptism of water. That's when a preacher baptizes you in the water. I'm going to be agree on that. When, when you're baptized, you've got a preacher, someone like me, taking you and putting you under water. Now, then we have, John said, there's one coming after me who is mightier than me that will baptize you with the Spirit. So, now we have a baptizing uh, with the Spirit. The first one was being baptized in water. Now we're being baptized into the Spirit. Now it's not the preacher doing it. It's Jesus doing it. The one who is mightier than John. And you're being baptized into the Holy Spirit. Then in 1 Corinthians 12:13, there's a baptism into one body. In this case, the Holy Spirit baptizes you into one body or Jesus. I call that salvation. When you uh, give your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit puts you into the body of Christ. You're now part of the church. I don't mean this church, I mean His church. You're now part of the church. Uh, now, real quickly, and then we're going to move on. Let's say I baptize Barb into water. So Barb is the subject. I, Dave, baptize Barb into water. Would that be the same as saying, uh, uh, changing places with the uh, first and third part there and saying, water baptize Barb into me? Doesn't make sense, does it? Water doesn't baptize Barb into me. I baptize Barb into water. So these last two baptisms, a lot of people say they're the same thing. I beg to, uh, I beg to differ. You can't switch the two and call them the same thing. So one of them is Jesus baptizing you into the Spirit. The other is the Spirit baptizing you into Jesus. They're not the same thing because they're two different entities doing the baptizing and it's two different substances in which you're being baptized into or dipped into. So, I believe as a Pentecostal evangelical that there is baptism, the three main baptisms, the baptism of salvation when the Holy Spirit puts you in the body of Christ. You ask Jesus into your heart, no water there. Then there's baptism of water, an outward sign of an inward act when the preacher puts you in water. And then there's the baptism of the Holy Spirit when Jesus baptizes you into the Holy Spirit. Um, and we're not going to get into all of, um, the different ideas there. We don't have time. That's, this uh, particular sermon is not the place for it. So, reading I bring all that out, I do not believe chapter three or, or chapter six, verses three to eleven, have any water in them. Where it said. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? See, the Church of Christ will tell you that shows you that you've got to be water baptized to go to heaven. What well, would if that was water baptism he was talking about? But he's not, he didn't say all of you who were baptized into water. He said all of you who were baptized into Christ. That's the third one on that dark list up there um, where you are baptism into the body where the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body or Jesus. So, uh, the baptism being referred to in these two studies last week in this is not water baptism, it's salvation. It's when you gave your heart to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit dipped you entirely into the body of Christ. Every ounce of who you are was immersed into Jesus. That's the baptism being talked about here, salvation. All right, now, now there are preachers in this town who will disagree with me. But you know what? You're not sitting in their church this morning. You're sitting in this one. Now, if you go to their church and they preach on this, do you think they're going to take my side to be fair? Do you think they're even going to present my side? No, they're not. So, um, what you're going to hear here, anytime you come, come here, you're going to hear what I feel the Word of God is teaching us. There's no water in Romans 6. Zero water. All right. So, now we get on to verse 4 in this week's lesson, part 2. After verse 3 again, Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ, not into water, into Christ Jesus, were baptized into His death? Immersed. Remember the word means to dip. Baptism. 
That's why it can apply to different things. A soldier goes to war and uh, his platoon is under fire. They call that the baptism of fire because he has been immersed into a firefight where he could live or die and he won't know till the fight's over. And that's the baptism of fire uh, to a soldier. To a scripture, uh, a Christian, I believe, in the first century, the baptism of fire, when you got saved, you were persecuted. And that was the baptism of fire. That's just my thought there. Uh, but at any rate, so here we go. We were therefore, in verse 4, buried with Him, totally dipped, buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. He says, when I was baptized into Jesus, I was baptized into His death. What? I thought the gospel was good news. You mean I'm dead? When I was baptized or born again and the Holy Spirit immersed me into Jesus, you tell me I died? Yes, you did. And it's not bad news. It's fantastic, unbelievable good news. Unbelievably. And I'll get to that in a moment. But right now, he said, that's what I want you to understand. Uh, And the reason we need to understand that we were baptized into His death, meaning that we are in Jesus when He died at Calvary, we were right there in Him. All right? We need to understand that so we can get the second part of it. Just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Uh, the New American Standard Version underneath. Therefore, we have been buried with Him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. There's the good news. Amen? We don't resurrect with Christ unless we die with Christ. All right, so we, uh, now what are we dying to? We'll see here in a little bit. All right, so just as you did some good things, here's a note now, just as you did some good things when you were by nature a sinner, before you got saved. How many of you have sinner friends who don't profess Jesus Christ as a Savior, who do some really nice stuff? We've all had them, haven't we? had neighbors that don't know Jesus, but they do some good stuff. But that good stuff doesn't change the fact that they're lost sinners. So people who are living in sin are sinners. People who are sinners, that's what the Bible calls folk who aren't saved, sinners. People who are sinners can do good things. All right, so I want to point something out here. Just as you did some good things when you were by nature a sinner, even so now that you are righteous by the new nat- by the new nature of your being united with Christ, you are now in Christ. You identify with the righteousness of Christ now the way you used to identify with the sin of Adam. All right? You were born into the human family. That's what Adam's name means, man. So when you were born into mankind, you identified with the first man, Adam, and were by nature a participant in his sin. So you uh, were a sinner. Now, when you're born again, you identify with Jesus, the righteous one, and you are now by nature righteous. God now looks at me. I scratch my head and sometimes I want to buy him a pair of glasses. God looks at me and sees a righteous child at his. I look in the mirror and I don't see it. That's what I'm praying this morning. Lord, let me see it. I'm talking about the kind of seeing it where you know the truth and the truth sets you free. That kind of seeing. Where you know that you know that you know that you know. When you live with yourself 24-7, it's hard to see yourself as righteous. But God who knows everything about me sees me as righteous. All right, so again, when you were a sinner, you did some good things. Now that you're a Christian who are now righteous in Christ, you still do some bad things. How many ever had dealings with Christians when they did something bad to you? And you know what? If I ask that question of every Christian in the area... They'd probably all raise their hand and some of them might be thinking about you. 
when they say they've done something bad. Because none of us are perfect. Nobody thinks we've always done the right thing around them. Uh, I'm sure there are people who think I've slighted them in some way. Um, and I'm sure I could put name some names of people I think have slighted me. So what? Life goes on. Amen? Life goes on. None of us are perfect. And so your friend... You know what makes friendship? I tell people, friends are two people who each decide to overlook the idiosyncrasies of the other. That's what makes friends. You decide to overlook the other's problems. Because I don't care who your friend is and how much they love you. They got problems. Sometimes in a good mood, sometimes in a bad. But you love them and you overlook it. That's what friendship is. It isn't finding the perfect person to hang out with. It's finding a flawed person that you have determined, I like that person, so I'm going to overlook their uh, idiosyncrasies and hope they'll do the same to me. That's what friendship is, all right? So now, we are now working. uh, The difference is, even though I can still do something bad now that I'm righteous in Christ, Everything, in spite of that, everything about me is new. Everything about you is new. You are now walking out your life in an absolute newness. That word um, uh, new up there, uh, where it said we, we too may now live a new life, Vincent, a Greek scholar uh, and commentator, says that that's not a strong enough word. Uh, the Greek word rendered new. He said new is not strong enough. This word means newness. More than just new. Everything about you is new. So even though I can still sin, everything about me is new. I tell people, now you're a Christian, you can still sin, you just can't enjoy it anymore. Because when that sin's over, you feel miserable that you sinned against God. Mm -hmm. Everything has changed in us. We're completely new. Verse 5. Why? For if we have been united with Him like this in His death, we will certainly also be united with Him in His resurrection. All right? So, the Bible's telling me, the good news is, when I died to Christ, I raised with Christ to a new way of living, a brand new way. Now, flip her over, verse 6. For we know that our old self, that's the person we were before we were Christians. We know that our old self was crucified with Him, so that, listen the body of sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. The New Living Translation renders it this way. Our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. This is the good news of what it means to die with Christ. When Jesus died, sin had no more effect on him. Now, he never sinned. But did you know the Bible says that Jesus was tempted in every point like you are? Yet without sin. That's what the Bible tells us. He was tempted. Every kind of temptation you've ever had, the devil threw his way. Every one of them. And he never sinned once. But he felt sin in the sense that he understood temptation for the first time when he is in heaven he never was tempted to sin ever so he dresses himself in humanity so that he can understand mankind better he created mankind but he created people that have the ability to sin because somebody got hungry I wish somebody had picked that Eve some food somewhere else. She could have eaten of any other tree in the garden. And then that weak in the knees husband of hers came up and she went, Honey, it's really good. Was that attractive? <laughs> you do it. It'd be more attractive. <laughs> Honey, that's really good. you got to taste this. Oh, okay. Uh, And that was that. We all became sinners. Now, God in the Old Testament, there are two reasons in my mind. In the Old Testament, God was much harsher with sinners than He is in the New Testament. Reason number one, the cross. Nobody had died for our sins yet in the Old Testament. 
Reason number two, God in Christ, for the first time in eternity, experienced temptation. A holy person who would never sin felt what we felt in the person of Jesus when the devil says, come here. And so Hebrews 4 tells us because Jesus felt that, he now sympathizes with us. Because we didn't have the perfection to resist it that he did. So now God can look at us different because he learned in understanding in the practical sense by going through temptation. Remember, he was dressed with flesh. People say Jesus uh, couldn't sin because he wasn't born of Adam. He had no seed of Adam in him, so he, he didn't have sin dwelling in his members. Do you know Adam, when he sinned, didn't have sin dwelling in his members? He was created perfect. Adam didn't have a sin nature until he sinned. Up till then, he was perfect. We don't know if it was for four days or 4,000 years. The Bible doesn't tell us. took a while to name all those animals, so it probably wasn't four days. But we don't know how long it was. But until he ate that fruit, not a, not a sin nature in him. So not, the fact that Jesus didn't have a sin nature does not mean he couldn't feel the pangs of temptation. But he had the spiritual perfection and maturity in him to say no every time. <clears throat> Excuse me, I need a drink. This is the preacher drinking. Oh, that didn't sound good. People are going to go home and say, yeah, I've seen the preacher drinking. Ah. <laughs> coffee, coffee. Yeah. All right. So, it says here in 6 again, because we were crucified that we should no longer be slaves to sin... Because, look at verse 7. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, Alfred, a uh, commentator, says this. As a man that is dead is acquitted and released from bondage among men. In other words, a man dies in prison for murder. Either, either he is put to death or he dies of old age in prison. He's a prisoner. When he dies... Humanly speaking, he is no longer a prisoner. They're going to take him out of that jail to some cemetery and bury him. Right? So, the prison has lost its hold on this man. So, Alfred is saying, as a man that is dead is acquitted and released from bondage among men, so a man that has died to sin is acquitted from the guilt of sin and released from its bondage. So, one thing, we have totally died. When we died with Christ... I have totally died to sin in the sense that it cannot accuse me. Every time I sin, I hate to say that people think I'm crazy. Just telling you what the Bible says. Every time I sin, God forgives me. Otherwise, I'd be saved and then lost. Then have to get saved again, then lost again. Saved again. How many of you have had a few days? Well, that would have happened several times. When it said that the blood of Christ cleanses us in First John one nine from all sin, in the Greek, according again, I'm not a Greek scholar. I'm quoting the Greek scholar commentary that I have in my Bible program. They say that in the present tense of the verb, it's saying that the blood is always cleansing me, never ending. It's what keeps me in a relationship with God. I sin before I can get the words out of my mouth, Father, forgive me. I've already been cleansed from all unrighteousness. That's what keeps me right with God in spite of me. All right? So, anyone who is dead is freed from sin. How many ever knew anybody that had a really bad character? I'm a really bad nature. He's just a bad person. And he died. How many times did he sin after he died? Not a one. Sin lost its hold on that individual after he died. That's what this is saying. All right, look at verses 8 and 9. 
Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we'll also live with Him, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, He cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over Him. So, we died with Him. And when He died, He cannot die again, because in God's human economy, it's appointed on the man to die once. Now you say, wait, 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 what about Lazarus? He raised Lazarus from the dead. That was a healing. Lazarus continued to live after four days of death. God healed him from being dead. And he continued to get old and die. He still had to face the finality of death at the end of that life. But most of you and I are never going to experience that. Anybody been raised from physical death in here? I told my heart doctor a couple of weeks ago, I said, keep the heart ticking because I'm shooting for 120. He said, 120? And I said, you got to have goals. <laughs> so I'm shooting for 120. Um, because I know that once I die, it just doesn't work for Christians. For me to die is a promotion. I'm going to heaven. Amen? Everything gets great. Everything but, like one preacher said, I'm not afraid to be dead because I'll be in heaven. It's the getting dead I don't like. And because I don't like the thought of getting dead, I'm shooting for 120. Now, that means my wife's going to be, at, uh, I tell her she can't die first, so um, that means she's going to be at least 118 or 19 when she dies. She's a couple years younger. She could die the day after me. I forbid her to die before me. Forbid it. This is me, a man, putting my foot down. You do not die before me. All right. So anyway, verse 8 and 9 again. If we died with Christ, we believe we'll also live with Him, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, He cannot die again. All right, now, verses 10 and 11. The death He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life He lives, He lives to God. In the same way, here's what I want God to blow it into my mind. I want to see this so desperately. I want, I mean, I see the words. I want to see it in the sense of understanding it. So desperately. I crave to understand it. Let me see the victory of Calvary. I crave to understand this. Verse 10. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way. In the same way. How do I do what he's about to tell me? In the same way. The same way as what? The same way in the fact that when Jesus died to sin, he died to sin once for all time. In the same way, Count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word count there is a bookkeeping term. Jack and Derek know a little bit about bookkeeping. You put it in the ledger. You record it as fact. King James uses the word reckon. It's the same Greek word, obviously. And it's a bookkeeping term. So here's what the Holy Spirit through the author Paul is telling me to do. Jesus died to sin one time forever. Write it down in the ledger of facts. I died to sin once for all. I shouldn't get up in the morning and decide I'm going to die to sin today. Because God tells me when I put my faith in Christ, when I... The Holy Spirit immersed me into the death of Jesus and pulled me out in likeness of the resurrection of Jesus. That just like Jesus died to sin, He could never feel another temptation. Once for all, the Scripture tells me to put it in your record book. You have died to sin one time forever. You don't keep dying to sin. You say, i got problems. i got questions here. Then how come I sin? This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. The reason we struggle with sin is because we don't get it. He says it, 
and we don't get it. But Jesus said in John 8, if we continue in His Word, stay in there. You put that thing on the shelf, you don't know what you're doing. Stay in there. He said, if you continue in the Word, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You don't get the truth by watching Hallmark. Now, don't get me wrong, I love Hallmark. But that's not where spiritual truth comes from. You don't get it by reading the newspaper. My God, you don't get it by reading the newspaper. Any kind of truth. You get it in here. If you continue in the Word. So when I struggle in an area, I say, My God, there's a truth I don't know, because you said if I know a truth, you'll set me free. So if I'm not walking in freedom, there's a truth I don't know. Open my eyes, Lord, and let me see. I have died to sin once for all. I'm out of time, so let me kind of paraphrase all this at the end. There are preachers who say dying to sin is what Paul had in mind in 1 Corinthians 15. Did I write it down? 1 Corinthians 15.31 When Paul said, I protest, I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. So Paul wrote to the Corinthian believers, I die daily. So a lot of people take that and apply it to the work of overcoming sin. Say, you've got to die to sin every day. You've got to die to sin every day. Is that what Paul was talking about? There are, are uh, I just gave you a few examples there. God, uh, translation called God's Word, the message, easy to read version. All say, no, that was on something else. No, I didn't take, oh, here it is, down here. The NIV the NLT, the Living Bible, the CEV, the ERV, the Good News Bible, God's Word, all of them render, where Paul said, I die daily, I face death every day. Paul wasn't talking about dying to sin. He was talking about his travels to preach the gospel were so treacherous. Read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and you'll, uh, chapter 12, 11 I think. The last half of chapter 11, and you'll see everything that Paul went through preaching the gospel. The man could have died a hundred times. And Paul said, I die daily. He was talking about in carrying the gospel to you, I die daily. He wasn't talking about dying to sin every day. He's the one who wrote, Likewise count yourself in the same way that the verse before counted that Jesus died once to sin. Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said likewise. Some translations say in the same way. Count yourself dead to sin. Mark it down in your record book. I died to sin the day I got saved. Count it that way. And one of these days, if you put it in the record book and remind yourself, it might click. I'm dead to sin. And then the next time you're tempted, you think, what? Why would I do that? I died to sin. And so my final exhortation to you, if you're going to die daily to sin, please don't take all day to die. That's what we do. We take all day to die and we wake up the next day and start the process over. Got to die to sin.